episode 39 of Let's Hear It. Today's guest is Andy Hess and his 1963 Fender Precision Bass, which he's had for over 25 years. And I first met Andy in the early 2000s, and I just remember hearing his sound. Uh, a big, fat bass tone, what you would want a bass to sound like, and that's that's the way Andy plays, and that's what, every anytime you see him, I've seen him in arenas, I've seen him in tiny clubs, and he always sounds great. And a lot of that, he will attribute to this 1963 Fender P bass. Oh, Andy's played with um, jazz people like John Schofield and Larry Carlton to... Rock bands like the Black Crows and Government Mule and lots of singer-songwriters like Roseanne Cash and, and more. And just a very versatile, great bass player. He's in Brooklyn, New York. Hello, Andy. Hello, Gary. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy to see you. I know you've uh, been on uh, you've been on dad duties. And now you are, uh, yes. Are you a uh, are you a teacher now? Uh, I, no, I'm not. But, um, you know, it's um, it's challenging, yeah, to say the least. But it's, you know, I'm getting better at it, I, I suppose. Well, that's good. Um, so what have you been doing uh, playing-wise? I know you've, you've been able to play a few gigs around town here. But, uh, yeah, I play a few gigs around town with some friends, mostly down in Red Hook, which is close to where I live in, uh, in Brooklyn. There's a place called yeah. Hometown Barbecue, and they, you know, they love having music. And so we've been playing outside on the street, weather permitting. But, you know, that door is kind of closing now with the weather cooling off. But um, yeah. it's been just fun to set up and play tunes. It's this little New Orleans group that I play with, you know, with Ethan Eubanks and Al Street and John Deli and Craig Dreyer. And we just have a huge book of New Orleans tunes and it's because we all love that music so much. So we... And playing that so it's just fun to get to play after months of just being holed up you know yeah so, i think so. i've i've seen uh, i think i've seen one show since march yeah i mean it's just you know and it's it's psychologically a little tough to sort of adjust to this new way of living and you know not i've been re recording at home some like i finally got my home i'm a little late to the game but like this year i got my home recording thing together and I'm able to track bass now. So some people have been sending me some stuff to, to record onto and, and, but you know, I've just been mostly at home and laying low. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, I know it's been as weird for me as it's been for you. Just the fact that our whole lives were centered around live music and recording sessions. So, um, some great stuff has happened this year, just, you know, doing things differently and, uh, having time to do things that, uh, you know, I've never had time for, and I'm sure, you know, for you to be home with a 10 year old boy and have all that time is great. Right. Yeah, no, it's great. There's a lot of rewards and there's a lot to be grateful for, you know, not to sound cheesy, but like, you know, there's millions of people that would trade with me any day. So like when I feel down about how things are, I also try to remind myself like, Hey man, we're all still here. I'm still playing a little bit. I'm here with my family. It's cool, you know, and hopefully things will turn around at some point and we'll get back out there and get to hit the road yeah. a little bit again, you know? Well, tell me about this uh, this Fender P bass. I don't know that I've ever even seen you play another bass <laughs> other than this and one. I know I have other ones, but it's like this thing where like, I always end up coming back to this one because it's my favorite and I've had it the longest and I just somehow feel really connected to it. It's hard to describe. I mean, you know, when a certain guitar might speak to you more and then you, so even though I have options, I have a lot of other basses more than I really need or should have just because over the years of doing it so long, you know, there was some that were given to me, but I always come back to this one because it's my favorite. It feels the best. And it's almost like this, it's weird it's almost like a friend or something you know i've traveled all over the world with it it's been on yeah. airplanes with me it's you know it's been everywhere you know i've taken it on tour and even when i'm not on a bigger tour but just a smaller tour i've carried it in a gig bag on the plane and guarded it with my life like i, I haven't retired it i still sometimes take it out on the mm -hmm. road even as as recent as like last year because i love it so much so i feel like i want to play it i don't want to leave it at home you know when did you get that bass? Um, I got this bass in 1994, um, and I found it. 
this is pre-cell phone and internet and all that stuff. And a friend, this drummer that I was playing with, he lived up in Connecticut, I believe, and he saw it in the bylines when you still looked like in the back of the newspaper or the Village Voice, you know, for an ad. And he's like, man, I saw this P bass for sale, all original, you know, early 60s. It's up here in Connecticut, some guy's house. And so then we drove up there and this guy was like, yeah, it's been under the bed for like 20 years or something, you know, no one's really played it. And it still had all the fit, most of the finish. Like, so all of this that you see, like that's worn off, that's mostly that I did that. Like there was some, yeah. there were some nicks, but like I've had this for, you know, 26 years now. And you know, I've sweated all over it. It's been, you know, smoke and, you know, I just, you know, it's been through the ringer, you know, it's fallen, it's, I've had to get it refretted because it wasn't staying in tune anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've had it for for a long time and, and it's the one I always come back to. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure when I see you on tour, you're traveling with a Ampeg bass rig, is that what you usually use? Yeah, I use an SVT, usually like a, an SVT, uh, you know, stack or, and, but I've also been using Aguilar a little bit too as well. So I've kind of, you know, I try to use the Aguilar when I can, cause it's also a very, it's like a modern amp, but it's simple. It only has a few controls, but I still love the SVT and I, you know, I still always love my Ampeg stuff too, but, um, you know, and a yeah. lot of times you don't have a choice. Like you'll be on the road and you'll request something, but sometimes they don't have it. And so you have to sometimes settle for an amp that maybe you're not so fond of. But yeah, Ampeg and Aguilar are like usually the most, most of the amps that I use. Aguilar makes those cabinets that weigh like two ounces, but they look like- Yeah, I have one of those. those. Those are good when you, on a rare occasion, you still have to bring an amp to a gig. Like when we play down at the hometown, you know? So I have one of those really lightweight cabinets that I can just bring and, and, and I have a little head. They make these small heads, but they sound good. Like I like them, you know, they're not everyone's cup of tea, but like, I like the fact that they just have, they don't have all this graphic EQ. They're like Ampeg in yeah. a way that they just have tone, volume, bass, you know, treble, whatever. And that's yeah. it. Um, well, give us some examples. Uh, show us uh, the sounds you get out of that bass. Let's hear what it sounds like. Uh, well, it's, you know, it ha I have flat wounds on it, which I prefer. I mean, I have some basses that have round wounds too, but flat wounds is just, I don't know, it works for everything for me anyway. I just like it. And it, you know, it just has that real kind of gritty tone. Wait. thick warm yeah I can hear that just coming through through the phone yeah and yeah, you know yeah. sometimes I'll do the thing a lot of bass players do that I know Jeff does it too but like sometimes I'll mute with my palm like I don't have the thing back here because I really like doing the like so I'm kind of pressing the strings down just ever so much to kind of give it a mute, like as opposed to having the foam, you know, there's yeah. like the foam piece. Um, so, so I'll do that sometimes, or you know, but I generally kind of play right over the pick, pick I, right over the pickup. It's kind of my zone, like that's. But sometimes if you move up the neck, it gets a little deeper. Like if you want something more dubby, you know, you'd roll the tone off. You'd be like. reggae kind of dubby kind yeah. of tone but you know if you're playing rock you want that tone up so you have that point and that definition um do you ever play with pick sometimes yeah a little bit not so much i'm not like you know i do yeah sometimes i do and it has a nice you know has that like So yeah, that's cool. Uh, that, it's great for that too. But I mostly play with my fingers, honestly. Yeah. Um, what do you? So as somebody who's played for years, like obviously you'll learn songs when you're going to do a gig, and if you know an ongoing uh, gig that you do, the New Orleans gig, it's at uh, 41 players. Yeah, it's the 41 players. You know, we just cover all New Orleans music. 
so you're learning songs a lot but just in, in for like technique and practice for somebody who's played bass for 30 years do you find yourself trying to, is there something you still want to learn or is it just like i need to be as good as i can be at what i do or is the, are there more goals for you to hit as a bass player I mean, I feel like it's never ending. Like every time you go on a gig, I always feel like, okay, here's a new opportunity, you know? Like now is now, like present, Let, let's play. And, and so there's always like this, yeah, you're always learning. And and, and like for me, it's not, I, like I still go back to old records that I love or, or go back and go, wait, how did that go again? And yeah, I'm always learning tunes, especially, you know, when I was on the road or, being like a freelance guy, sometimes it would, you know, like I subbed on the Roseanne Cash gig, so suddenly, oh, I gotta learn these 20 songs. So sometimes the practice and the work is is within just having to learn a, a, a book of music for a gig. And then that's your practice, because you're trying to memorize the stuff. And then, you know, with the cover stuff, I mean, it's the same thing. You're learning all these old covers and you're really checking out what the parts are and how they work together. And so, yeah, I feel like it's never ending, really. Um, when, so was bass your first instrument? Is that what you started on? Yeah, I started on bass. And, um, you know, at first it was just sort of this thing of like, well, one friend plays guitar, one play, friend plays drums, you're the tall dude you got to play the bass, you know? Because <laughs> you were the tall and, dude. <laughs> yeah, and like that was the instrument that was left, you know? And then, but I was, you know, I was drawn to it because I had already heard a lot of records before I started playing. Like, like I was aware of a lot of records that then later when I started playing, I rediscovered as a player. It was like, man, I remember hearing this, you know, Johnny Guitar Watson record. Like, wow, now I play and so I can play along and learn that stuff. So I was always drawn to it and... um yeah, somehow, yeah, I, I just immediately fell in with it and felt good in my hands. And I was like, yeah, the bass, this is cool. I, I liked it right away as a kid. You know, I, I think yeah, I was there about 14. Is a particular uh, bass hero of yours that was inspiration for you? Um, uh, for me, early inspiration as a kid, it was, you know, I was really into those Jimi Hendrix experience records. So, like, I, I kind of was into Noel Redding and then Billy Cox with Band of Gypsies. But then I started getting into blues heavily, like tradi more traditional blue, you know, like B.B. King and Muddy Waters. So I would check those guys out that played on those records. You know, and as I developed, it was like, you know, John Paul Jones was a big influence, Led Zeppelin. You know, I was a kid, it was rock, I was into ACDC, but I was also into soul music. So like, I loved yeah. Nate Watts, who played with Stevie Wonder, and I loved like, I think it was just a lot of my parents were playing these records, like Rufus and Shaka Khan. Like I love Bobby Watson. He played an old P bass, those early Rufus and Shaka Khan records. And, you know, then I got into the whole R&B thing and just, you know, Willie Weeks and, and Chuck Rainey and, you know, all, all the all the cats, you know. Yeah. You know, Carol Kay and all those people that were really, you know, had a, had a voice stuck done, yeah. Yeah, that's the... Uh... That's pretty much what I figured. It's funny because I was thinking about uh, Noel Redding from Jimi Hendrix t uh, a couple days ago. And, yeah. uh, and I just loved hearing him play because he, you know, Jimi Hendrix, obviously unbelievable. But if you listen to Noel in the background and there's no rhythm guitar going, it's just like, whoa. Yeah, yeah it's pretty powerful, you know. And yeah, he was more a guitar player and he just kind of went to bass, I guess, when he joined the experience. Um but, you know, he was just somebody because it was, you know, it was also visual as a kid because I would open the records and I'd look at the pictures and I'd get the mag, you know, music magazines and I'd see pictures of him. And that's why I got a jazz bass because he played a Fender jazz bass. So like, yeah. oh, Noel Redding plays a jazz bass. It looks so cool, you know, with the covers and like the, you know, and, you know, it was like also very visual. So it was like, that's cool. I need to have that a bass like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a, it's that that stuff made the impression on you when you were a young kid in the pre-internet days. You would open up an album and see those pictures, and it was, yeah, it was right. It was like this endless, like you'd read every little word, and then you'd reread it again, and you'd smell the cardboard, and maybe there was a poster inside, and 
you know, and you'd listen to, this, you know, Acts as Bold as Love, I remember, or Electric Ladyland, you know, was like. It was like getting yeah, was, transported somewhere when you put those records on. Yeah, it was so like, what is this? It was also this big mystery, you know, because back then they're just, as you know, they, we just didn't have all that uber information that we have now. You had to kind of, you know, work on it or like, you know, it was a big deal to go buy a record or two, you know, with your allowance, you know, as a 14, 15 year old. You know, you just study these records like or I remember getting the first couple police records. I was really into the police, too. You know, so I was all over the map musically, really. There were so many things that I loved, you know. Yeah, I feel like that that kind of era, obviously through the 70s, but up until about 81, 82, because that encompassed like the clash and the police yeah. and Blondie and records were still sounding really cool. Really, to me, yeah. like, you know, the. 82, 83 arrow and that uh, recording techniques and drum machines and computers and stuff came in. That, that was a little, some of that stuff doesn't sound very good to me anymore, but. Anyway. No, that's true. Yeah, there were a lot of bad sounding records, you know, like that just were like, oh, you know, something happened, something, what's happening? Yeah, it, it's funny that you mentioned the police too, because the police had, I there's the police. never, they just didn't sound like anybody. Obviously you could hear some reggae influences and, it was so whatever yeah. yeah yeah it was so unique and the the material the songs were just so cool so good you know and the play, bass playing was great i mean sting played just rock solid you know you know so lonely like it was just like you know or or uh yeah is that so lonely yeah so lonely um so you know like those were it was powerful as a kid you know like that that stuff yeah it was just man well great to chat with you man um why don't you give us a couple little examples and i'll let you i'll let you go on your way okay cool um so like i you know today is duck dunn's birthday i found out so like i kind of went back and like you know i love booker t and the mgs and the meters like all those kind of bands that were instrumental bands that started that way but then became bands that backed up singers you know you know like the meters with dr john and alan toussaint and, and and booker t of course with otis redding and sam and dave and all those guys so i was really drawn to to those bands too you know more like as a late teen early 20s i was like oh my god the meters and booker t and the mgs and and, and what is that and just the way they played as a combo so like duck dunn and al jackson were really great at sort of propelling music and they backed up you know all these people albert king and and so i kind of you know like a great bass line I mean, he played really simply you know he wasn't like a jameson up in detroit who was you know obviously one of the greatest of all time but duck had this way of being really rock solid and supporting the music whether it was you know the instrumental stuff that they did or whether it was the otis stuff so like you know for instance sign such a great bass line you know it's very simple but that record you know that albert king record on stacks is so good you know and the bass stuff as simple as it is it's just driving the thing and, and the, the way they you know interlock with their parts like no one's getting in each other's way and that's what was amazing about the meters too is that their parts just worked really well together as a as a four-piece band yeah so like that's a classic duck done you know uh baseline right there <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, the other thing I think about those records too is because they weren't, they didn't have, you know, 48 tracks, 72 tracks. There was so, so much space in those recordings in the, the bass particularly, I think, um, and I'm sure a lot of engineers would tell me I'm completely wrong and I probably, maybe I am. But when I hear the old records, I can hear the bass so much better. I can hear the tonality of the bass. I can hear the parts better. And maybe it's just because there's not as many tracks on, on some of those classic old recordings. But, you know, Jimmy Hendrix. I think, Hendrix that's, or, I think yeah. that's a good point that you make there. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, Pro Tools took the wideness of the bass and pulled it in. And it feels like there's bass, but... You just somehow don't hear it as well. Maybe I'm going deaf. Well, maybe there's a little bit of that. I, I definitely have been suffering from some of that of playing loud, loud rock gigs. But um, but no, yeah. it does sound better. And especially, and if you listen to it on vinyl, especially that stuff on vinyl, if you have yeah. a really good stereo, you can really hear like it's like you're in the room, you know? Yeah, I don't know if you uh, if you remember, there was a couple of years there. It was uh, around 99, 2000, 2001, where Neil Young toured with uh, with the MGs backing him That's up. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw a few of those gigs. And gigs oh, and you Duck did? You got to see that? I never saw that. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. And Duck Dunn, just, uh, I mean, it's just so great. Powerful, was... man. He was powerful. I mean, he's very simple. Like, it's nothing fancy. It's real, like, you know... Uh, I don't know how to put Bed it. Rock. But yeah, it's just, and then the thing that he had with Al Jackson, you know, the, it's all about the rhythm, right? It's all about the drums and the bass. The bass is only as good as what the drum, drums yeah. are giving you. So like, and that chemistry, you know, it just doesn't lie, you know, and with those guys or with Zig and George Porter, same thing, man. You know, they were just up the river from each other, you know, kind of doing the stuff at the same time. Well, when I hear you play, when I hear you play with Ethan, I forget what it was. I guess it was maybe a Bill Sims gig a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, Bill. Oh man, I miss Bill. He was a rest in peace to Bill. But uh, I remember coming down there to watch watch you guys do the uh, the Bill Sims gig and uh, just hearing you and Ethan play. And you guys have that thing where you just lock in. And obviously, you've played a lot together, but there's something the way the way you guys go together is really is yeah we good. have a nice we have a nice thing you know he and i definitely for sure and like also just kind of you know uh, being a little bit rubber bandish too like you know it's very musical with him you know and yeah, and yeah it's really fun and just having played a lot together we really kind of know each other's playing pretty well so you know lots of shuffles <laughs> Which is, you know, P bass, man. Yeah. It's just fat, you know. It's like yeah. I never went back to the jazz. Like as soon as I started playing this, I was like, okay. And I still have my and I love my jazz basses and they sound great. And they're cool for certain things, but somehow I just this bass, man, it's like it still had all the fin you know, it's all gone. Like I have photos of it where all this is still there, you know. Well, that's awesome. Maybe someday Fender will make a custom shop version of your bass. Replicate it. I'm just happy to have this one. I hope to never lose it. Or... All right, Andy. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Gary. I appreciate All it. All right. Well, thanks, thanks Andy. It's good to talk to you. All right. Well, great to see you. You as well. Maybe I'll make it out to you one of these well. 41 players gigs if there's another one before it gets too cold. I'll let you know. It, it's always good to see you. All right. Thanks for having me. You too. Thanks. All right, bye. Yeah. Fun to chat with Andy about his bass and music and old vinyl records and Duck Dunn. Uh, check back in a couple of days for the next episode of Let's Hear It. And uh, see you soon.